Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to the ninth CD Deshmukh lecture from the National Council of Applied Economic Research in New Delhi, India. My name is Shekhar Shah. I'm the Director General of NCER. And we are privileged both to host the ninth CD Deshmukh lecture. And I'll say a few words about the person who we honor today. And I'd like to introduce our guest today. Um, CD Deshmukh, uh, Chintaman Dwarkanath Deshmukh, uh, was the first Indian to be appointed to the Reserve Bank of India in 1943, pre-independence, and consequently was also a member of the Indian delegation to the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference, and indeed was there at the birth of the IMF and the World Bank. Um, and I have a word to say about that. Uh, he was also thereafter the uh, finance minister in India uh, from 1950 to 1956, and it was at that point that he became the founding father of NCER, which was established in 1956. He was thereafter the chairman of the University Grants Commission and also the vice chancellor of Delhi University. We are very privileged to honor the memory of C.D. Deshmukh, uh, which is, of course, part of the legacy of the National Council of Applied Economic Research. There is a saying about him, uh, and in fact, I don't think that's a saying, it's actually the fact, that uh, as a senior member of the 1944 delegation to Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, uh, John Maynard Keynes was deeply impressed with C.D. Deshmukh and indeed talked about his dignity, ability, and reasonableness. And the word goes that Keynes was very keen that he become the first managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Um, that, of course, did not uh, transpire. But we do have a direct connect to the IMF today, and we are deeply privileged to have as our guest speaker for the C.D. Deshmukh lecture, Geeta Gopinath, the chief economist of the IMF. She is the first woman chief economist, uh, which is, of course, fantastic. But her other job, where she's from leave for public service, is at Harvard, where she is the John Zwanstra Professor of International Studies and Economics. Geeta has an illustrious uh, background, but has been, during these troubled times since March of, 19, of 2020, a highly influential voice guiding us in how we should think about the pandemic, the impact on the global economy, and how we can see our way out of this uh, pandemic and the kind of havoc it has wrought all through the globe and through the global economy. Uh, Gita has been a economic advisor to the Chief Minister of Kerala. She has been a co-director of the International Finance and Macroeconomics Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Also at NBR, she has been closely associated with NCER as the co-lead for the Nimrana conference that NCER started many, many years ago. She's a member of the Economic Advisory Panel of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and of course the Indian government has awarded her the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman the highest honor conferred on a overseas Indian. We are absolutely delighted that Geeta is, is with us, and she's going to share with us her views on the global economic outlook, but also uh, talk about something that is, I know, very much on her mind, which is the divergence that we are seeing and will see as the uh, pandemic hopefully comes under control with the vaccine winning the race with the virus, and as we see countries normalizing and hopefully then recovering. So it's going to be a very interesting evening. I want to also welcome all our attendees. Uh, we have a large number already. Uh, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to share your questions or comments. We would be delighted to take them up in the time that we have. Um, we are also live on YouTube Live, the NCR channel on YouTube, and indeed on the IMF Live channel. Both uh, are carrying the live stream from this conference. 
So with that, let me turn over and ask our guest of the evening, Gita Gopinath, to deliver the C.D. Deshmukh lecture. Gita. Thank you, Shekhar. It is really a true honor to be giving this lecture, uh, you know, just learning about uh, C.D. Deshmukh's uh, accomplishments is really, really impressive. And to be doing the memorial lecture for somebody who was at the founding of the IMF is uh, uh, particularly special. So I'm really happy to do this. And also thanks to everybody who has, uh, who has, uh, who was attending this, um, this uh, seminar and, uh, you know, I really look forward to your questions at the end of my uh, presentation. So I'm going to share my screen uh, and then hopefully you will see it and I will walk through what's on the slides. Slides are good. Uh uh, Gita, slides are good. Okay, excellent. Can you turn to the uh, full presentation view so we'll see the full slide then? Okay, now this is uh, one second. Let me go out of this. I have to. I have to see what this is. You just you just did it just now a second back. Did it work? Okay. All right. I thought you said it wasn't. Uh, Showing up. Is it showing up as two split screens or is it showing up as one? Was it full? Uh, no, you just had it full and then I think it was just a time lag. I spoke too soon. So go ahead okay. and please do the slideshow. Okay. Let's, okay, I'll hit the slideshow button now. Let's uh, hope it shows up. It'll show up and I'll tell you when I'm seeing it correctly. Okay, so I'm seeing it correctly. Is that good for you? Uh, not quite, but let's give it a few seconds more. Okay, one second, let me just try something. Okay, how about now? Uh, not quite, but we're just waiting. Huh. Um, what do you see right now? Uh, I just see your screen before the slideshow, you know, with the slides running on the left-hand side. Oh, okay, a, I'm just going to wait then because that's not what I have on my screen right now. Okay, this is, you're not seeing it, I suppose. I have the main thing. Let me just do this again. Sorry about that. Gita, would it be possible for you to restart sharing? Yeah, just I'm trying to. Okay, I'm going to just stop it again and then restart. It should work after that. Okay, you see this, at least you see this right now, the, uh, what do you see right now? Do you see my screen? We see the slides, uh, but not the, uh, not the slideshow, not the full okay, screen. Okay, so I'm going to, now I'm going to click on slideshow and let's see hopefully this will work. Does this work? It kind of worked for one second briefly. I think there may be, you yes. know, let's just go with this. Uh, if you can just mi minimize uh, the uh, index on the side, just slide it down. Uh, it's just that your, uh, your notes will also show up. I believe the notes are also showing up here. Um, okay, just give me, uh, you have the, uh, the the PDF. Do you want to play from your end and then I can just speak through it? 
Uh, we could do that. I don't uh, see why this is. Uh, I have no idea why. Okay, let me just. Let me. Okay, let me minimize this for one second. I want to do that. Uh, and I think that's good. This is good. We can keep going on this. I'd much rather you have control. That way, you can take whatever time you want. Okay, is that that's as good that's as good. it gets? That's, that's good. Right. That's good. That's good. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so, my plan for this talk was I wanted to first uh, start out with an uh, overview of the uh, global economic outlook for this year and going forward to see, to kind of put things in perspective in terms of where we are in this crisis of a lifetime and you know, what is the story that we are seeing at this point um, you know, across the world uh, and for individual countries. Uh, and then that would lead me to the picture of the divergence that we're seeing in, in prospects across countries, but also within countries uh, and the risks of that getting exacerbated and how, uh, what can be done to address it. So that's the, uh, that's the flow of the talk. So as you can see, uh, this first and foremost, when you are talking about this crisis, you have to talk about the pandemic because that's the source of the problem. And it's first and foremost, a health crisis. So where are we with this? Uh, at this point, you know, this is now a race between the virus, uh, which is mutating uh, and vaccines or any kind of therapy that might make this uh, less potent health problem than it is uh, at this point. So what you see here in the left graph uh, is you see the number of new cases uh, around the world. Uh, and you can see the, the blue line is for advanced economies. The red line is for emerging markets. And remember this is per million population, so it's scaled by population. Uh, and you have the green line, which is the low income countries, which you can you know, barely see right at the bottom, because if you look at the, at least the counted cases, they are very low. Uh, and then you have India in there, which is the solid black line. What we have here is we had the first wave, which was in uh, March and April of uh, 2020, which looked incredibly serious. That's when countries went into the lockdown and which is why we call it the great lockdown. Uh, and then you had uh, countries that brought the number of cases down uh, quite significantly. They started reopening. But then towards the end of last year, you started seeing in uh, advanced economies this second wave that came back uh, very, very strongly. And as you can see now, like right now, if you look at the most recent data, you are seeing a control of those number of cases. It's come down globally. The number of cases have come down quite uh, substantially globally. But the number, you know, the this, this second wave, and in some countries, the third wave was, in terms of the number of cases, was really uh, bigger than the first time around. Um, and this, you know, I, there were epidemiologists who told us that this was likely. So it was obviously good to be prepared for it and to take the right uh, actions in anticipation of something like this. So India's picture is quite unique in some sense. If you look at where, what's happened with the number of cases, you had the number of cases go up fairly gradually initially, and then go up very quickly, somewhere in the middle of last year, August, September, peaking around that time. Uh, and then it starts coming down. You have the, uh, you know, India reopens, it comes out of a very stringent lockdown, probably one of the most stringent in the world. Uh, and you've had a, a very steady decline in the number of cases. The number of cases now in India, are just uh, active cases are extremely low. So this is a bit different from other places where whenever you reopen, you just see another wave of the, um, of, the, of the pandemic. Now, while the number of cases are at record highs globally, new cases are record highs globally, if you look at the number of new deaths, uh, you also see that compared to the first wave, there are now more, many more uh, deaths. Uh, we're now across 2 million worldwide. But again, in terms of death rates, that's a much lower number than during the first wave. So, you know, clearly uh, lessons were learned on how to deal with this, um, with this virus in terms of healthcare and treatments. And, uh, and you, so you do see 
that um, the death rate was lower. But this is kind of the picture as we stand for in major parts of the world where you have a, a virus that you know, is, is, is certainly uh, strong and going through and, uh, and mutating. You have deaths at, at record highs. But then again, you have the, the, the vaccine story. The vaccine story is the one that's the story of hope, which is that you have, um, a bit, you know, over the last, on, uh, towards the end of 2020, you saw this uh, uh, incredible news on uh, vaccine success with multiple vaccines succeeding. And, and, you know, we sort of pause and remember that this is historical, the speed at which this has happened uh, is, not, is not something like we've seen before. And, and by the way, if you want to talk about the benefits of, uh, of global cooperation, at least the scientific community did incredibly well in um, coordinating and, and, uh, isn't, and one of the reasons for this, these kinds of very fast rollout of vaccines also has to, something to do with that. Um, so you had multiple vaccines that, that are successful, that have been approved to different degrees in different countries, and there are many more in the pipeline. Uh, that with the expectation that many of them will actually be quite successful. I mean, there's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is one shot vaccine that's likely to show up. There's also the, uh, I'm told about vaccines that could be just, you know, you know nasal vaccines that, that, that are also being worked on. So there are many possible uh, kinds of solutions that we have here. Uh, so right now, you know, it's about getting these vaccines into the arms of people and I, I'll come back to this. And this is where we, we, the world is falling short. So what does economic activity look like? Uh, it's useful for me to look to kind of compare this crisis, which is what we call the great lockdown, to what happened during the great uh, global financial crisis. So if you uh, look at the red line, that's what you see in terms of global GDP uh, around the global financial crisis. Uh, and the green line is any other recession. By the way, this looks at a sample of countries in here are mostly uh, advanced economies, because those are the ones who were actually hit by the global financial crisis. Most of the emerging markets in the developing world were not as were not so badly hit. So just to make a relevant comparison, we're looking at the ones that have been hit in both these crises, in the global financial crisis and in this great lockdown. Um, what you see, of course, is that in terms of the collapse in activity that you had in 2020, there's really no, I mean, it, several orders of magnitude higher than what was seen during the, um, uh, the global financial crisis. Much steeper uh, decline, this is what, what we have. And then what is interesting is of course, the very sharp rebound that you do see, uh, which is again, what was expected because the reason activity collapsed was in the response to the uh, pandemic, uh, you know, governments put in place uh, restrictions and mobility and going out and what you could engage in, and that just mechanically brings down uh, activity. So your big collapse. You saw. So it was expected that you would have a rebound of this kind, uh, but I think it's fair to say that the rebound came in uh, stronger than many people expected. So the, uh, the the scare that people had that this would change behavior and that there would be long term, um, you know, there would be greater scarring that would happen in terms of behavioral scarring, and people would want to hold back at least until we are durably past the pandemic doesn't seem to have been the case. I think people were actually quite quick in returning. That was one. Second, many countries provided a lot of income support during the, the lockdowns. So they, so it, people were in a position to, to spend when the uh, lockdowns were, real, were removed. So we are there, but again, the, we are still below, as is quite clear from the blue line, we're still below the pre-pandemic level globally. This is, this is by the way, the, what you have on the x-axis are the quarters. So this is three quarters out. This is basically the, the third quarter of 2020, calendar year terms. Uh, so there's been a rebound, but we're not, we're not back uh, there yet. And the concern is if there will be uh, a further deterioration in case you have some kind of a new uh, virus strain that uh, creates, uh, you know, that is more resilient to the therapies and vaccinations that are there. And that would of course be a pretty scary scenario. Okay, so what do we make of this? So right now, given, uh, given this race between the virus and the vaccines, 
given that we uh, ended the third quarter of 2020 with a, with a stronger rebound than was expected globally, by the way, um, what do we make of the, the next several months going forward? So, of course, we're not going to get to uh, full herd immunity in all parts of the world in the next two, three months. As, as things stand, our assumption is that the advanced world and, uh, several, and some emerging and developing economies will get there towards the second half of this year, some, some of them earlier in the summer. But you know, second, some, somewhere around, I would say, I guess the summer, either the beginning or the end of the summer. Uh, and then for most other countries, you're talking about uh, 2022, uh, end 2022 in terms of getting there, at least given the current rollout of, uh, of vaccines and access to vaccines that you see around the world. So given that we have a few more months of this uh, in uh, of living with the virus, what do we expect will be the hit on economic activity as countries put in restriction measures? Uh, what the left graph is showing you is what's, the, what's been the sensitivity of mobility, which is, by the way, a statistic that many have followed, which nobody ever did in the past, but that's been a crucial, that's been a very, you know, very useful indicator. Uh, what to track how that mobility, which uh, gives you some sense of what's happening with economic activity, uh, how has that changed as these cases have gone up and down? The first thing to take away is that in the first wave, which was in uh, spring of last year, uh, there was a very negative impact. You could see that in terms of, uh, of when restrictions are put in place. So you saw a big drop in mobility. Uh, and then you've uh, seen that as time went by and you had further waves of this virus, firstly, countries started putting much more targeted lockdowns. So it was you know, more constant kind of locally targeted as opposed to being nationwide. Uh, and secondly, people also got adjusted to, to, uh, to living some with the virus uh, and being able to kind of go around their daily activity wearing masks and kind of adapting. So economic activity is in some sense a little more disconnected from the number of cases that exist around the world. And, um, and also, in, and if you look at mobility, so for instance, if you look at the US, mobility has barely budged since uh, the middle of last year, but economic activity has continued to recover. So there is, there is very much a sense that economic activity has learned to adjust to social distancing norms in terms of you know, uh, restaurant deliveries happening, people doing more restaurant meals at home, uh, exercising, which they used to go previously to, to gyms, but now most of that is being streamed and that's being done at home. Uh, you know, telemedicine, of course, education. Uh, so all of that has adapted. So that tells you that while you will see extensions of lockdowns in parts of the world as this virus is still raging, uh, the impact on activity is going to be negative, but somewhat less negative, not somewhat actually, significantly less negative than what was there in the first wave. And you can see it in the right graph, uh, this is what's called the Purchasing Managers Index for Services. I mean, just, just very simply, it gives you a sense of whether you think it services uh, activities expanding or contracting. If it's above the 50 number, you know, 50 line, that means it's expanding. If it's below it, it's it's contracting. The the purple dots uh, are from the first wave. This is from sp the spring, and you can see that uh, when you had the first wave in April uh, 2020, the collapse in services sector activity was was huge, uh, and you can see. I mean, India is by the way also in there. You see IND there, um, and then you have the December plot where you have, as you saw, cases higher than it was during the first wave. Uh, but the, and you do see for countries that have been hit, which is like Germany, Italy, Spain, Japan, you do see uh, a decline in activity, uh, but it's much smaller. And then you have countries like the US, for instance, where uh, you, know, you have a raging virus, but you, you still haven't seen, you've actually seen services activity holding up really well and continuing to do well. India, of course, is also above the 50 line at this point, but then India is again is one of those countries where actually the number of cases are, uh, are way down. So again, so that's the first piece of it, which is looking forward, what should we expect the world to be is that there will be restrictions, but the impact on economic activity will not be as severe as it was the first time. The second thing is, you know, countries around the world provided a lot of uh, lifelines 
to households and firms. Uh, and we, we now know just from all the evidence that those have absolutely helped. Now, there's been a, a great divergence in how much support was provided. So if you look at the left graph, which tells you the income support numbers, it tells you the share of countries uh, in each income group, which is advanced, you know, share of countries among advanced economies, the share of countries among emerging markets, share of countries among low income countries, uh, with higher than 50% replacement income support, which means that if, uh, you know, somebody, uh, lost $100 worth of income, they got replaced with at least $50 of that. Um, and you can see that for advanced economies, almost overwhelmingly, we're getting close to 70% of them provided over 50% of replacement income support. Um, and uh, when you go to emerging markets, that bar is much smaller, we're getting down to like 20%. And when you get to low income countries, you're getting to 5%. So this is, by the way, a story of the of this crisis, which is that uh, advanced economies have used their fiscal space, and of course, they're much less constrained to provide a very large amount of support. In fact, in the US, for, for uh, many of the recipients of the income support, uh, the replacement rate was significantly above one, so that in case they lost $100, they made more like 110. So this was quite, uh, quite substantial. And what happened is that when that you did, and so if you look at, for instance, uh, spending patterns by different households uh, in advanced economies, you do see a very well, you know, spending pattern get, holds up very well for the lower income groups. Um, while it is among the, the wealthier groups that actually consumption has fallen, but that's again, just a pure reflection of the fact that they've had to you know, hold back. This is like pent up demand. You can't go to restaurants. Restaurants are closed down, and and those kinds of activities are um, are, are being are being held back. Which tells you again that if we get past this uh, this uh, crisis sometime in 2021, you know, the the fears of of large amount of scarring in many parts of the world may, may be attenuated, and you could see pent up demand coming back. Now. Along with pent up demand, of course, you have other kinds of legacies that will come out of this crisis, which is the middle graph. Uh, again, this is, uh, applies because of the data availability. This applies only to advanced economies, the middle graph. Um, but what you saw here is the red line. So that red line is the global financial crisis. And what you see is the you know, time zero is uh, when the crisis hits. And you see this sharp increase in the number of bankruptcies uh, in, in advanced economies, which is a red line during the global financial crisis. Um, you see the green line, which is any other kind of plain vanilla crisis, and you see usually bankruptcies go up. But then you see what happened during the great lockdown, it, because of all the moratoria that were put on, you know, paying your loans, paying your mortgages, um, you know, the banks giving you giving you time to you know basically see banks being told to hold off on, on requiring payments, uh, many kinds of utilities not being paid, uh, all of those kinds of things. You've actually had the phenomenon where in this crisis, which where you had a very large collapse in the real economic economic output, you actually had a drop in bankruptcy. So bankruptcies fell relative to the pre uh, pandemic level. So what does that mean? Well, that means that once these policies start being taken off, uh, as the recovery starts, you are bound to see an increase in bankruptcies because it's just that this is the pent up bankruptcies uh, that you would likely see. Uh, because you know, this is, a lot of this is just not, not something that, uh, you know, there are a lot of companies in here that would have gone bankrupt in normal times that haven't. And so the implication of that is uh, you know, how big of a concern is that? Again, now that varies tremendously across countries because there are countries whose banking systems are very well capitalized where the increase in bankruptcies, increase in non-performing loans that will uh, follow from, from uh, when these policies are withdrawn will not have much of an effect on the banking system. The effect will mostly be seen in terms of jobs, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, because SMEs especially are, uh, uh, big job creators, so you would see more of you would see it, uh, an effect in jobs, especially of you know maybe lower income, lower skilled people. So that's where the area would show up. But then there are other countries uh, where you enter the financial crisis with a much more vulnerable banking systems, uh, and you know uh, India is one of those. 
Uh, and like the RBI said, non-performing loans can go up uh, quite significantly, so I think over 13%. Uh, and, and of course, that will have implications for banking sector health, for credit creation, and so on. So one has to prepare for this uh, going, uh, going forward. Uh, and the preparation, of course, involves making sure that you have you know, the insolvency and resolution frameworks that can work fast, that can be very efficient. Uh, that would be one part of it. A second part of it is would be for the banking system to, to raise capital right now with very easy financial conditions that you see around the, around the world, including uh, in India. Uh, and, and that helps kind of prepare you for it. Uh, and also the governments might have to think about whether they need to put in a capital infusion. Uh, the right graph is another graph which is really unique to this uh, crisis, which is usually in a, in a crisis, household savings rate go down. Uh, but here you see that household savings rates actually have gone up. Now, part of it, of course, is that when you're forced not to spend because you can't, you've shut down uh, a lot of sectors, then uh, you know, you're not traveling and all of that. Then, of course, savings automatically go up. Um, and so what that tells you, but then also because of the, again, income support measures that were provided in, in many parts of the world, uh, that rate has gone up. Again, this, this picture, by the way, doesn't apply to the world as a whole. I would say it's weighted towards advanced economies where there has been a lot of income support. So this again tells you that when the economies reopen, if there is not a long delay in that, you should certainly see an increase in uh, increase in, in demand coming back. Uh, again, now let's look at what happened to global trade. Global trade on the left uh, shows you again, we're comparing uh, this crisis, which is a solid uh, lines to the dashed lines, which is a global financial crisis. Global trade has come back much, much more quickly. Uh, this again, you know, part of it was expected because this is a very particular crisis where you're shutting down activity. As manufacturing has come back up, you've seen global uh, trade return. This is by the way, trade in goods, not obviously trade in services. Trade in services includes tourism and travel, and that is still, uh, subdued, so we have, there's a still big hit over there. But in, in terms of goods trade, you've seen this uh, recovery uh, happen. Um, so what the, what does that tell us? Firstly, it tells us that uh, you know you, it it reflects the the recovery in manufacturing and retail sales that you've seen around the world shows up in in uh, in goods trade. Uh, the second thing it's, is that there was a concern that with these very disjointed kind of pandemic restrictions around the world, the global supply chains would be very hard hit. Uh, so, so one could have worried that maybe there would be an even bigger hit to global trade over and above just the drop in demand. Uh, but that is not something we've seen in any dramatic way, at least, uh, as of now. So, you know, global trade has come back up. So these breakdown of supply chains, there was a concern, at least for now, is not, uh, is not a, major, a major concern. And of course, you have the middle graph, which uh, tells you that, again, a unique aspect of this crisis, which is that while we had the uh, uh, historic recession you know, of, in 2020, the, the worst uh, global contraction in peacetime since the Great Depression, uh, the, it, we, there was no global financial crisis. The tremendous uh, policy support that was provided in terms of uh, monetary you know, interest rate cuts, asset purchases, all of that around the world brought down interest rates everywhere. And uh, that spread into emerging and uh, developing economies too. So if you look at, for instance, uh, what you have to see in the middle graph, just lines, I mean, all that you wanna see is that in the beginning, there was this big increase in borrowing costs for these countries. Uh, and that has come down quite, uh, that came down quite substantially. Now it's still somewhat elevated relative to the pre-pandemic level, but given the stress countries are facing, this, these are, um, low interest rates. And if you look at especially EM, emerging market investment grade countries, you can see that the borrowing costs are basically back to pre-pandemic levels, and in some it's even lower. So this is, this is uh, you know, on the one hand, this obviously has been a great, uh, uh, you know, a blessing to have not have a global financial crisis along with a, with a big collapse in the real economy. Uh, because it's helped, it's helped countries uh, respond much to this, provide the fiscal measures that were needed to deal with this crisis and prevent any kind of a banking sector uh, distress. But, but on the other hand, uh, there is obviously a, a, a concern that with all the uh, 
easy money that's floating around. Uh, there, there are all kinds of risk taking that's happening. And you see that in very many different speculative asset, asset classes. Uh, you see, you know, the, you, 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 there is a real concern that maybe there's some sort of complacency that's creeped into financial markets that these kinds of support measures will always be there. Uh, and there's only one way for price uh, for asset valuations to go on, which is up. Uh, and this is, a, I think this is an important issue for uh, authorities to, to keep in mind, to kind of pay very close attention to. And I, you know, it's difficult to, to take these measures off the table in terms of interest rate cuts at this point, because we're still in the midst of the crisis. But you have other tools uh, that you can use, regulatory tools that can be used to ensure that the, you're not ending up with a huge amount of um, buildup of risks uh, uh, for for even you know uh, uh, households who are now getting into the retail trade on on the asset market. So uh, where do we think? So you know what's the what's the likelihood that interest rates will go up and this picture will change? Uh, on the left, what the right graph tells you is that it tells you that the the number of countries, for instance, the blue line is the share of countries with inflation below target, uh, and the red line is the share of countries with in inflation expectations below target one year ahead. And that's, you know, we're getting to over 70% of the world, so some, around 70 to 75% of the world. This is this is their GDP weighted, by the way. Um, and what, you, what you're seeing is, so there are many, many countries whose inflation is still well below target. Uh, given the risks of uh, inflation being too low, which is what some central banks have to worry about, uh, I think they will take a cautious approach uh, to, to raising rates. Uh, they will wait to see whether inflation is not just in, is gone up, but is going up, expected to go up durably uh, before they start uh, withdrawing support. Uh, the, the story, of course, is while, while you have the financial markets that are uh, buoyant and quite exuberant, uh, you have the other story, which is on the labor market side. Uh, and labor markets have recovered. I mean, they collapsed tremendously during the peak of the crisis, which is what you see in the left graph. And total employment fell a lot. Uh, and they've recovered in many countries, but they're still uh, significantly below the pre-crisis level. Uh, and it's not just in terms of, uh, you know, people who are looking for a job and can't find a job, but you also have people who've just been disillusioned who've left, dropped out of the, mark, of the labor market. So labor force participation rates have also uh, fallen off. And uh, you know, are are uh, 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 I mean, are, are slow to recover. And of course, there are very different rates in different countries. In some countries, it's recovered faster, but in others, it hasn't. So this is going. This is, by the way, a feature of this crisis, which is that you're going to see some um, in, uh, income groups where you're going to see employment would be disrupted, and the concern that maybe some of them will not return to the labor force. Uh, and that has that is another area that will need uh, will need addressing. So um, these are this uh, the we are, okay. So we have a, we put out the World Economic Outlook a couple of days ago. Uh, again, just to tell you what the assumptions are. The assumptions of the baseline are advanced, advanced economies and some emerging markets will get to broad access of vaccinations by the summer of 2021, while the rest of the world will. You know, by the time we cover the entire globe, we're getting towards the end of 2022. Uh, that financial conditions will stay as they are right now. Um, and while there's been an increase in uh, oil prices since the since the you know the whole collapse, it's going to um, it's still well below the pandemic level, pre-pandemic level. So here were our projections that we have right now. Uh, this is the the world is for 2020. This is our estimate. Uh, of uh, the contraction in global GDP, which is three and a half percent for 2020. Um, by the way, just you know, as a comparison point, in April of 2020, when we put out the first World Economic Outlook after the pandemic hit, and that was those were very early days when it hadn't even moved to many parts of the world. At that time, we had estimated that the collapse, we had projected that the collapse would be around, uh, you know, three point. 3% using the current PPP weight. So, so it, you know, it's, it's in that ballpark. We're estimating it's now 3.5, negative 3.5. Uh, but again, you know, we'll see as some more data comes in. Uh, and then we have global economy growing, uh, projected to grow this year by 5.5%, and, and then moderate to 4.2% next year. 
Now, again, these kind of eye popping numbers when you, you know, typically don't see global economy growing at five and a half percent is a reflection of the hole that it's coming out of. Uh, that um, you just had a very, very bad year the previous year. And so this is just some of these very low base effects that you're seeing. Uh, advanced economies, and I'll come back to this, but there's a great variation in, in outcomes within advanced economies in terms of their recovery. Uh, let me put the, this is the emerging market in low income countries. Again, emerging markets collapsed, uh, you know, two and a half percent. But again, to keep things in perspective, you must remember that this is, um, you know, advanced economies have a higher average growth rate. So the collapse, you know, when you look at negative 2.5, you think, well, it's not as big as advanced economies, but the advanced economies are never expected to grow that fast. Uh, 2021, again, you have a rebound to 6.3% and then in moderate to 5%. Again, a lot of variation across countries. So we had an upgrade uh, for 2021 of 0.3 percentage points relative to our October forecast. Where did that come from? That basically came from the vaccine success that happened between October and December and the considerable support that was, additional support that was provided by the US and, uh, and Japan, fiscal support that was announced. Um, okay, so let's see. So, if you use if you use these projections, this is kind of what the uh, what the world looks like. So, what exactly is this graph? This graph says, let's look at what we are uh, projecting now in terms of 2022 GDP for each of these uh, regions and some countries, uh, and let's compare it to what it would have been in the absence of the pandemic. That's kind of the useful number to look at. Uh, because otherwise, just general growth rates are not going to tell you that much because, again, like I said, you've come out of a big hole, you're going to see some big eye popping numbers. Uh, and countries differ in terms of their potential growth rates. You know, advanced economies don't have that much, you know, don't grow that so fast relative to emerging and developing economies. So it's, it's the gap that's really relevant. And what you see here is if you look at the AE bar, which is the advanced economy line, you have a, you know, around a two and a half percent drop in uh, the advanced economies uh, that in terms of their output loss, which is again, their output that we think we are, we are projecting for 2022 relative to what it would have been in, in 2022 without this pandemic. That's about a two and a half percent gap. Uh, emerging markets are you know, more like four and a half percent that the gap is, but there's lots of variations. So if you look at the parts of the world where that gap is the smallest, you know, among the major economies, uh, the US and China are quite ahead. You have um, smaller contractions, just a little over 1% in terms of the gap again uh, for these uh, parts of the world. Uh, while, if you, for instance, you compare the US to the Euro area, the Euro area, the gap is, all, is almost 4% relative to around 1.3% for the US. So again, the recovery speeds are really uh, quite different. If you look at um, uh, emerging markets, if you look at China, you know, again, barely 1%. Uh, and, but if you look at the leftmost bar, which is the one which is the longest bar, that is emerging Asia excluding China, and that of course includes India, the gap there is around 8%. Uh, so again, even within emerging Asia, while there's been uh, clearly you know, a lot of success in terms of containing the virus in different parts of, uh, of emerging Asia, but the, the gap that is there in terms of what, where, how, just how much they have to travel to kind of cover, uh, to get to the pre-pandemic level is quite significant. Uh, the number for India is around 9%. So it, the, um, again, the output loss in relative to what we would have projected uh, pre-pandemic is around, uh, 9% and in 2022. But again, of course, the, these are pictures that evolve over time. You know, policy announcements make a big, uh, you know, if new policies are announced, these bars can change. Uh, if there is a much more concerted effort to get uh, vaccinations faster with a quicker resumption in activity in, in your own country or in every part of the world, these bars can change. So they obviously, you know, they, they, they will adapt over time. So we'll see how this goes. But as of now, very, very diverging recoveries. And that divergence is also there uh, within countries. So if you look at um, the change in unemployment rates, uh, this is uh, 
for most of the countries in the sample, this is basically the third quarter of 2020 relative to the fourth quarter of 2019. So it's basically what happened to unemployment over the first uh, nine months of 2020, right? Uh, and you can see what was increased in the unemployment rate. And you see that if you look at different skill categories, if you look at the left graph, you see that among advanced economies, the red bars, which is taller, uh, you have this bigger increase in unemployment rate um, among the uh, low skilled uh, workers relative to high skilled workers. And similarly in emerging market and developing economies, you again see this bigger increase in high skill, uh, sorry, in lower skilled workers relative to high skilled workers. Now, of course, for, for, you know, these are harder things to measure for developing countries because they're very large informal sectors and data for these uh, sectors are not, that, you know, are not that easily available. So again, I think this is, it's very important to keep in mind that even if you see strong recoveries in a lot of emerging and developing economies, data some does not necessarily capture the inf informal economy so well, and there can be deep distress over there, which is what, what we are seeing. And the right graph also shows you that age obviously makes a, made a difference, which is that with younger, uh, work, younger people coming onto the labor force, um, this is around between the ages of uh, you know, 25 to uh, you know, 35 or so. Um, and they, you know, they, they're the ones who are getting hit because it's always the case that when you enter the job market, in a, in a, when the economy is collapsing, it, it's just that much harder, right? It's just much harder to find a job. Uh, when you're a new person on the market. Uh, and this is, a, by the way, another uh, concern because what we've seen from past crises is that this can linger in people's memory for a very long time. So studies have shown that, uh, you know, if you enter uh, the job market at a time when the, you know, the economy is in recession, it seems to have a very long-term effect on your job prospects in terms of the income that you earn. I think it's a combination of things. It's, it's the fact that people... Um, you know, are less, and if you are, if you see something like a deep crisis, very when you're very young, you're you're less likely to take risk. Um, you're also, um, you know, can be more scarred by by uh, uh, an episode of this kind. But again, this crisis is quite unique. So there is still the hope that once we get back this get over this hill of the health crisis, that activity will come back faster, uh, and and maybe some of these previous patterns that lingered for a very long time will not linger uh, as much. Okay, so uh, what do we need to do to, uh, to fix the divergences? So start with, again, this is a pandemic-driven crisis. It ends when the pandemic uh, is something we can completely live with if it becomes like a regular flu. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, we can go around our normal uh, you know, business. Uh, and so for that to happen, it just has to happen globally. And this has become very clear when you see all the new strains that are coming up from different parts of the world, that the pandemic is not over until it's over everywhere, because you can always have a new strain. And we know that, um, you know, uh, naturally built up antibodies, which come because you got infected to one particular strain of the virus doesn't necessarily translate into another strain, doesn't give you uh, protection from another strain. Vaccines, are able to remain partially effective, but not fully effective. So the best case scenario is to just very quickly get to large scale uh, vaccinations around the world, because that's also what will prevent these new mutant strains from, from emerging. Unfortunately, the current landscape does not look very promising. If you look at vaccine supply coverage, that's the left graph, you see G20 advanced economies, you know, the, the richer world having access to uh, and I would say some developing economies, emerging markets also that are having access to vaccines um, much more. In the advanced economies, they've got many multiples of their population at this point that uh, they have orders with. I mean, that was the kind of a insurance that they were taking to make sure that they actually got a successful vaccine. But right now there are multiple successful vaccines. So I, there is a, a very good case that there has to be some sort of a mechanism to make sure that these surplus uh, vaccine countries uh, get those vaccines going to countries where there are real shortages. There are many poorer nations that are exclusively relying on the uh, WHO kind of uh, co COVAX facility, uh, which at this point is supposed to get them about 20% coverage by the end of 2021, which is not enough to get to uh, herd immunity there. So uh, this obviously has to be escalated. 
The middle graph shows you the fact that even if you have the vaccine, it doesn't mean it's going to get into somebody's arm because there's a fair amount of vaccine hesitancy around the world. Some places much worse than the other. Now, over time, we are seeing some improvement. This is from December. This is a survey from December on, uh, on vaccine demand. Uh, and uh, you know there are countries there, for instance, France looks particularly uh, uh, hesitant at 40% of the people willing to take the vaccine. Um, but uh, if you, if, if I think over time, this is picking up. Uh, and then of course, there's the right graph, which tells you that, uh, you, you know, again, you have to, this is a incredibly logistically, you know, challenging thing to do to get an entire population vaccinated. Uh, and for many countries, it's off to a slow start. There's the exception, there's Israel, for instance, that has administered a dose to over 40% of its population. Um, you know, the UAE is up there too, but you can see, and this is based on uh, January 23rd numbers, the US is around fifth below. Uh, so there's a, there is a long way to go and you have, have India down there, just given this population size, of course, in terms of uh, getting to a percentage of its population is going to take a, a it's going to, it, it takes time. But again, India is doing a very ambitious vaccination drive and, um, you know, with very amb ambitious targets. But again, this is, I would say like the number one policy issue that needs to be addressed is to fix the unequal access to vaccines, to get over the vaccine hesitancy hurdle and to get the logistics, to get, get it into people, get the shot into people's arm. And that's what's going to help with preventing these divergences because the divergences are coming about because people are getting it at very different times. Uh, the other, of course, concern is there's some harder divergences that will probably get worse because in which it comes from uh, countries that rely more on oil exports because while indeed oil prices have are about 25% higher than what they were in uh, 2020, uh, you know, it's still well below their pre-pandemic level. So for many of these countries that have oil exporters, the recovery will be more challenging. Countries that rely heavily on tourism exports, for them too, it's a challenge because for sure cross-border travel is not going to come back as fast as within country travel and within country returning to uh, restaurants and so on. So again, for them, this is, this is a longer period. So, I mean, what's this, what, what needs to be done? Of course, for oil exporting countries, they, the, it, they have had to think about diversifying their economies. And that I think just gets accelerated with this crisis. For tourism dependent economies, this is a, a long a hurdle, and I think they will need support from the international community to kind of tide them over this pretty difficult period uh, when you are completely short on your uh, on your revenue from tourism. Um, okay, in terms of the uh, divergences, again, I, I, I told you something about the income support, which is another, the figure on the left is another, ex, you know, kind of a depiction of the fact that there were many low-income countries, which are the red dots that had over, you know, almost 70 to 80 percent of their population uh, seeing falling incomes, but they kind of got no, almost no support from, from in terms of fiscal policy support. So even relative to emerging markets. So this, this is one big reason, again, for the slow divergence, for, sorry, for the divergence we're seeing across countries. Um, and the solution for that has to be, of course, for each country, a government to prioritize uh, the ones that are fiscally constrained to prioritize where they spend. I think the two clear areas are health and transfers to the poor, and that has to be an absolute priority. Uh, and again, for international community, including the IMF, uh, to give uh, funding kind of support to these countries. And we've done that. Uh, we have 82 countries that we've extended financing support for uh, over the, the last, uh, you know, 10 months uh, and with, including emergency financing to many of these countries. The right graph is something I really worry about, which is again, source of uh, divergence is one, one of the big factors that go into potential growth for a country is the, what's happening to its human capital. And there's a generation of students who have been hit by this crisis um, in, especially in developing countries, in emerging markets where Yes, they've gone towards some kind of distance learning, but that's just not going to be effective. So again, this is again to prevent the diverging outcomes is going to be very important for governments around the world to make this a priority too, in terms of remedying this loss of, uh, of education, 
you know, through extra you know, tutorial support. Because if you're just going to move a kid up to a next grade without having with having missed almost an entire grade of learning, um, you know, that's that's going to be very very tough on on the students, and it's just not going to be I mean, good in terms of uh, building human capital. So putting in resources to make sure that you're able to bring children up to speed is, is very important. Uh, this is a graph on the diverging policy support. It just tells you how, how dramatically different it was. Advanced economies were at 24% of their GDP was spent in 2020 in support measures. That number for emerging market and middle income countries is 6%, for low income countries is uh, 2%. I have the number there for India. As you can see that the overall number for India, the bar is taller than if you just look at the average for emerging market middle income countries. But an important difference is that India has relied most heavily on, you know, uh, what we call below the line measures, which is basically uh, indirect support measures that are in the form of providing, uh, uh, you know, collateral, you know, loans, equities, um, credit guarantees, and so on. And uh, a smaller fraction that's been done in terms of additional spending, just direct spending. Uh, uh, compared to other countries. And even, even the, the amount that was budgeted around 2.2% or something of that has been used at this point. So that's an area where we've made this point that you know, we see scope for India to do more in, pro in providing direct support to, um, to poorer households and also to, um, to small firms. Um, so there's always a question that comes up when you tell somebody advice in, in a developing country to do to spend more. The question is where you know you, you, you hit with the constraint. Where does the money come from? Uh, I think the point is uh, firstly that again this is repeats a point that I made earlier, which is that because of the tremendous monetary easing around the world, borrowing costs are at um, real lows. I mean, in some cases, just record lows for many of these countries. So that so that opens up space for them to borrow. Of course, you want to be able to lock in these uh, low interest rates for a while. So you want to borrow at uh, an extended maturity so that you don't have to worry about uh, rollover risks. Um, in fact, in India, I think the average rollover, the average maturity right now for the for government debt is about 14 years, which is, you know, uh, gives you a nice buffer uh, in terms of uh, uh, worrying about issues like rollover risk. Capital flows also have returned to um, uh, emerging markets in the last three months of 2020, you're seeing a big, a big push over there. Uh, and India has received a significant amount of these portfolio flows, I think around 21 billion or so. So there is money coming in. Um, and here's a picture here. So again, I think this is a, this is what the world looks like on the left. So if you just focus, it, it goes back, it goes back to 1880. So it's a long uh, historical shot. It tells you what happened with the uh, uh, with the level of public debt globally in percent of GDP. The blue line is for advanced. So it's not globally. This is for advanced economies. The blue line. Uh, you can see that right now with the Great Lockdown, you've had global glo public debt in advanced economies. You know, if you really stare hard, it slightly exceeds the World War II peak. But along with that, you've seen the big drop in in interest rates at which these countries are borrowing, which is at a historic low, I mean, a really historic low, even despite the fact the debt is at a historic high. Uh, the right graph is the one for uh, India. And you see that again, you know, debt to GDP for India has gone up to over 85%, driven also a lot by the denominator, which is the fact that GDP fell, uh, fell quite a bit. Uh, but if you look at 10-year sovereign yield, which is the borrowing cost of the government, uh, one of the measures of that, you can see that that is uh, at, at a you know, low level. In fact, it's lower than pre-pandemic uh, at this point, this is, which is a reflection of, uh, again, you know, RBI interest rate cuts, but, and more generally liquidity in the, in the system. I have just another couple of slides. Uh, again, to prevent the, the great divergence, uh, you're going to have to, countries will have to deal with the legacies of this crisis. And like I told you at the beginning, one of the legacies is, uh, you know, while it's been tremendously successful in preventing bankruptcies, maybe, you know, but this is going, there's going to be some pent up bankruptcies that are going to come back up. Uh, and given the fact that credit growth was already um, slowing in India before the pandemic, uh, and, uh, you know, the, and the kind of non-performing assets, which certainly improved 
uh, over the last couple of years has come down and that's, that progress has been made there, but still this is not a problem that's going away. Uh, and again, NPLs will likely go up. So this problem could, could, be, is, could be, become a drag on uh, India's uh, uh, recovery, uh, which needs uh, attention. And I already said what will be needed at the, uh, at the beginning. Okay, and I'm just going to end with this is my last slide, which is to talk about to say that uh, um, you know the pre-pandemic world was not was far from perfect. We were already in a bit of a low growth uh, situation for the world uh, as a whole, um, and you know it, uh, you know many countries were already slowing. So, you know, policy should also keep an eye towards coming out of this, accelerating out of this crisis with, in towards more inclusive and sustainable growth. That can be done through infrastructure spending. If infrastructure spending, if done well, um, you know, with good governance, with uh, high quality projects, well implemented, uh, you know, has the virtue of giving you more than a, more than a dollar for every dollar that you put in. So, it, it has the virtue of, of also being able to fiscally bring down the level of debt to GDP. Of course, that has to be done well without, you know, well-managed projects have, that would give you that bang for the buck. But again, in the case of India too, of course, there's a big need for in public infrastructure spending uh, and that should be a, a priority, but to roll it out in a way that yeah, you're looking at high quality projects uh, and there's good governance involved there. The middle graph tells you that another big challenge that the world has been has faced is facing is in before the pandemic and continues to be a big threat, which is on climate change. Um, and this pandemic obviously tells you what nature can do. This is, uh, you know, uh, climate crisis will be many orders of magnitude more than that. Uh, at this point, the world is headed the baseline. That's the blue line is a world where global carbon emissions are going to continue to rise. Uh, which has, you know, very large catastrophic implications for countries around the world. You're seeing this in terms of uh, floods and drought and uh, hurricanes and, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, catastrophes. But, there's, but it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, you, we've shown how through a combination of uh, green infrastructure investment plus a predictable path of carbon pricing, which then incentivizes the private sector to move towards more uh, you know, uh, to move towards a greener, greener investments, that combination can bring it down, which is the, which is the black line, dash line. Uh, and of course, a, a legacy of this crisis will be that there will be emerging into markets and, and low income countries that will exit with high levels of debt. Many of them entered already with debt distress, they will remain in debt distress. And for them, um, it, you know, financing support will have to be provided, but in some cases, we will just need some uh, outright debt uh, restructuring. And I think for the world as a whole, of course, you want to build forward to more inclusive uh, world, uh, and that would include not just spending measures, but even on the uh, even on the uh, you know the revenue side to make sure that you uh, have the right amount of progressivity in your tax uh, revenue collection, um, and also the fact that you know for the international uh, for multinational corporations, make sure that they're actually paying their fair share of taxes. Uh, how do we do taxation in the digital economy? I think all of those are big, big issues uh, on the table. So uh, with that, uh, I will stop and stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you, Gita. Uh, that's a fabulous uh, to the horizon of what we have seen and what we are likely to see in the coming months. Um, and I was particularly struck by the way you have also focused on medium term growth and the potential that might have been hurt and how we can regain that potential um, in terms of particularly things that have happened in education, things that have happened in labor markets, uh, and indeed the caution that you uh, recommended uh, in terms of the fragility in some aspects of India's financial sector. We have a whole bunch of questions and I'm going to be selective, uh, but let me start with a few. Um, a question about the forced savings that we saw um, during the pandemic with people unable to consume effectively, and that now being a trigger for the kind of V-shaped or early V-shaped recovery that we saw. And then that kind of fading out, and what do we then need in terms of being able to raise demand in our countries, especially countries that 
have a lot of focus on services where contact services are extremely difficult yet to uh, have any momentum in. So your thoughts about how this early pent-up demand making itself felt and then what should we be looking forward to to be able to sustain and actually continue to grow out of this pandemic? Yeah, so uh, indeed what we saw in uh, the uh, third quarter of 2020 as countries reopened was you saw this pent-up demand and that and you saw that mostly in retail trade, in, in, uh, in goods, you know, and in some cases in the services sector, but much, but less so in the services sector, that came up. Now the question is, is that like a one-off thing and that's it and that happened and that's not going to, people have you know, done what they needed to do and it's not gonna happen. This, is, this I think firstly varies across country. Uh, if, the, if you were a country that was able to provide the income support that was needed, then that would give people the confidence that they don't have to hold up savings to uh, to you know in in the risk that there might be another wave of this uh, crisis, so we're seeing clearly in countries where the replacement rate was quite generous, uh, you get you I think over there there's certainly a sense that there will be spending that will come back up. People will spend because they just the social safety net is stronger. In places where the safety net was not stronger, I think that's where you would have more of the hesitancy to spend because you want to kind of keep it for, for the, uh, savings purposes. Second, of course, is what you, ex what you think is going to happen with this pandemic. If, if indeed in this first half of this year, the international community does fantastically well and everything goes in the best possible way, then again, that will prevent the scarring that will come from it. Now, in general, how do you bring back uh, demand is, of course, to to have people get their jobs back and get incomes back up, bring employment back up. So making sure that you are seeing a, a healthy recovery in employment, uh, you know, not just in the formal sector, but also in the informal sector uh, is, is, will be very important to kind of bring back, um, uh, bring back spending. And of course, there, is, there, is, there are some ways that the governments can also make sure that there are enough jobs, which is, you know, public infrastructure spending is usually very job rich. Green, green investment is very job rich. Uh, and again, if well done, that would be another source of job creation. Thank you, Gita. Uh, a question uh, from Jimol Uni, one of our uh, university academics. Uh, would relatively low share of income support vis-a-vis -vis loans and equity and guarantee support in India impact inequality? And what's your thinking on that? Uh, and maybe if I could just add on to this in terms of global divergence that you spoke about, um, the fact that income support has been much more profound in the advanced economies and much less in the EMDs, um, will that also affect what you were just saying about the demand support that will come uh, from the income support that has come from these countries? So do EMDs face a double jeopardy in A, not having provided more income support in the first phase, but thereafter uh, that playing out in uh, perhaps less of a demand push than uh, the advanced economies and therefore leading to greater divergence. So the two parts to this question. Yeah, so on the second part, indeed, I think, uh, I mean, it is, it is what we are likely to see, which is where parts of the world where there was generous income support there is much less uh, behavioral scarring. There's much less desire to save more. And remember, you know, in many parts of the world, there are right now moratoria on paying your rents, um, on paying, uh, I mean, the loans that you, you know, the payments that you may have to make on your loans. All of that is there's hell. So, some of the saving is obviously going to go into into dealing with that. And if there were, and if it's not enough, and you worry about it, and, and you can have good reason to worry about it, then of course that will also hold back. Uh, hold back uh, demand uh, in in these countries. Inequality, I think, is a major concern. I mean, the World Bank has also come up with a report. They flagged that uh, the risk of uh, millions entering poverty, uh, extreme poverty. I think that's a big, uh, a big, uh, big risk uh, for many countries, including for India. Uh, and that, I mean, the struggle, of course, is data. Uh, we, you know, it's it's. We don't get enough at a, at a monthly or quarterly frequency. It's hard to get good data, even in terms of employment. Um, and, and of course, with employment, it's tricky because it's not just what the unemployment rate is. It's about people in the, who are getting out of the labor force. 
So these are, um, I mean, these are made, these are important uh, um, concerns, which is why, you know, we have said that the uh, the policies that, for instance, the uh, in, in, in kind and in cash support that was provided in 2020, um, which expired in 2020, should be should be deployed again for this year. Uh, and also the, you know, the employment guarantee, uh, uh, you know, the, the scheme that provides employment, Manrega, which was expanded uh, last year, uh, is also would be useful to keep that in an expanded form for this year. So that again, you, uh, you are able to prevent this, this rise in inequality. And also, by the way, uh, you know, even this crisis has hit uh, women more than men too. I mean, another point to make, because women are the ones who are mostly the uh, caregivers. Uh, and they've also tended to be in more hospitality intensive sectors, so they've been harder hit. So again, I think it's not enough to look absolutely at the aggregate number that we, we see. I think you have to really look at what's happening to the entire distribution. Um, question about uh, the uh, concern that uh, you also expressed about education. And uh, in that context, uh, the global communities uh, thinking on support for education in developed countries. And of course, the International Chamber of Commerce has come out with this study showing how indeed, uh, in this case with the vaccines, if the unequal distribution of vaccines uh, uh, continues and is not remedied in some way through COVAX or other uh, approaches, uh, because of the dependence of countries everywhere on global supply chains, you're going to see a lot of ramifications, even in the short run, uh, to do with the impact on uh, GDP growth uh, and levels in developed countries. So there's an education aspect to this, of course, in terms of you know, medium-term growth, uh, and then uh, more immediately on the unequal distribution of uh, vaccines and how that might uh, play out uh, even for the developed countries. Yes, in fact, we also put out uh, some numbers. We did this, we had done this actually in October where we said that if uh, we can make faster progress on ending this health crisis uh, by indeed getting vaccinations to be um, you know, much more globally widely available, then that would add uh, $9 trillion to the global economy between 2020 and 2025. And 4 trillion of that is around 4 trillion of that goes to advanced economies. Because when the world as a whole does better, uh, advanced, advanced economies do better. I mean, I mean it's, uh, it's not just for trade linkages, but it's also just in terms of confidence, in terms of, you know, uh, it's, it's just a big boost for the global economy. On uh, um, the growth model that uh, underlies the projections that you shared with us, um, with uh, the kind of 11.5% growth that you project for India, um, given these macroeconomic challenges, uh, what are some of the specific assumptions about this kind of growth estimate? Um, this may be too technical or detailed a question, but uh, your general thoughts on how India can sustain and, and continue to grow at the kinds of rates that uh, you're projecting? The, you know, the 11 and a half percent number uh, comes from, again, from the fact that you're coming off uh, what we've estimated as an 8% collapse uh, the previous year. So it's, a lot of it is pretty mechanical, which is that if you, were, you know, there was the, um, the second quarter when uh, India's GDP year on year contracted around 23% or so. And then the next next quarter, it was 7%. Uh, and just that recovery that you have, if it carries over in, you know, into the next, into the following year, even if there is not much quarter on quarter growth that's happening in India over 2021, just the fact that you had a really massive collapse in, in 2020, uh, and that, and and you had you had that recover towards the end of the year. If there is no more, even if there's literally no more further growth that happens after that recovery, quarter on quarter, you have a very large number in terms of what the growth rate is going to be year on year for the calendar year as a whole. So there is that that effect. So again, like I said, I what I like to do is always with these numbers, you always want to um, you look at the combined effect. Uh, and again, you know. 
uh, and relative what you would have projected. So even if you have, a, if you do a very simple adding up, we're looking at about over two years, India being about two to three percent bigger, uh, when it's usually twelve percent bigger at this time. So if we still have a nine percent gap, uh, nine to ten percent gap that has to be filled. Uh, but so yes, so I think the I, the what you have to keep in mind is that the these this number of eleven and a half percent comes from a very severe collapse that happened in in 20, uh, 2020. Um, Keith, a bunch of questions on debt. Uh, it's a big concern, obviously, with the extremely high debt to GDP levels that we are seeing. Uh, what's the fund's view in your own uh, in personal view about how countries might deal with this situation? Uh, focus on fiscal rectitude and uh, immediate kind of fiscal discipline, uh, or try to grow their way out of the debt situation that many countries will face. And on balance, where are you coming out on this dilemma? So firstly, uh, for now, it would be damaging to uh, start tightening uh, in the midst of the pandemic. That would be that would be counterproductive. It would hit the long-term potential of the country. It would hit activity now, uh, and so that's you know we are we are encouraging countries not to do that. To at least in terms of whatever policy support they were able to provide, uh, as long as you're in the midst of the pandemic, and especially if you are asking people to stay home, uh, and then in that case you have to provide the supports. Right now, of course, what you also want to be able to do every time you communicate on your fiscal plans for now is also provide confidence that you have a medium term fiscal framework that uh, will bring the deficit under control once we are out of the pandemic and once we are in a durable uh, growth phase. Uh, and, you know, that can be done through talking about it's clear that some of these, these measures, these, these pandemic uh, exceptional measures will be withdrawn. Uh, you know, you ex the growth will, growth will return, also some of it just mechanically because of a major collapse. Uh, but also in terms of specific plans, like in the case of India, uh, more, more effectiveness in GST collections, there's still a gap over there. Uh, more credible divestment plans, uh, there's always been the intention, uh, but that hasn't happened as, as intended. So kind of credibility on all those fronts will, will also give confidence to markets and keep borrowing costs low during, this, uh, during the transition. Uh, and of course, um, you know, a perennial problem is always that there is, a, there is a lot of wasteful spending that gets done in budgets. And this seems like a great time to also think about how you're going to, to get rid of those uh, and do better both in terms of uh, your revenues and your expenditures. Um, as it just so happens, um, one of our previous uh, uh, Deshmukh uh, uh, orators is on the call, and I'm going to ask Martin Wolf to join us. Martin, can you hear me, and would you like to state your very important question? Martin? Yes, uh, I, can, I can hear you. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we thank can. You thank for, you. Thank you for the lecture. Wonderful overview. Saved me a lot of time. Uh, um, the question is as follows. Larry Summers has recently argued that with, I think, uh, in view of a change of administration, that there should be an early meeting of the G20 heads of government that would, rather like the London summit in 2009, try to shape a global agenda, agenda for renewal and recovery after this crisis. If that were to happen, it would seem conceivable that Mr. Biden would pull one. What will be the most important things, in your view, for the heads of government of the G20 to agree now to drive the recovery we clearly need? So I would say number one is to make sure that there is uh, broad-based access to vaccinations. So that includes not just getting the supply of vaccines to them, but making sure that, the, that they have the financing to get the logistics done. I mean, that seems like an absolutely the most urgent thing. Uh, secondly, it's quite clear we're seeing diverging recoveries. Uh, we have poorer nations who are 
uh, you know, who could barely spend during this uh, uh, pandemic and are still the ones who are at deep uh, debt distress, which means that they're going to fall severely behind in their in achieving the sustainable development goals. It's important for the international community to come through with, uh, you know, uh, financing uh, in terms of you know, concessional financing, but grants, uh, you know, everything should be on the table, including SDRs. Uh, 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 and um, in, in terms of uh, strengthening recovery for the globe as a whole uh, and moving towards the uh, a newer economy, which is sustainable, uh, you know, having some kind of a synchronized green public investment push uh, by countries that have the fiscal space would, uh, would also be a third very important uh, action by, by the G20 countries. Martin, any uh, further comments on that and anything that uh, you feel? No, uh, I, think, I think it's absolutely right. But I think, I mean, implicitly, the point is, though the world hasn't done, I think, incredibly badly, in many ways it hasn't done at all so uh, terribly badly. But there, there have been a real lack, I feel, of global coordination in response to the challenges Gita has mentioned. And as a result, I think the crisis has caused and will cause more damage than necessary. And since it's a staggering crisis, that's very, very serious. And we have to recognize that probably hundreds of millions of lives will be unnecessarily damaged as a result. Yeah, I think that's a very genuine concern. And I hope that Gita, between you and your neighbor across the street, Carmen Reinhardt, uh, the two chief economists of the two multilateral institutions that are, I think, very appropriately placed can raise these issues with uh, the EDs of the US and certainly the US administration. I think Mr. Biden would have a very great opportunity to show his leadership in this area. Indeed, if he were to do what, uh, what Larry Summers and, uh, of course, Martin is pointing out. Okay, so let me then move on to, we have still another seven to 10 minutes and we'll try to take a couple of questions, but Geeta, would you like to come back on any of these things in terms of um, what the fund itself is planning and how the pandemic has affected not just the research part of the fund that you head, of course, but also fund operations. Um, and I know that this is a question that, that Carmen also is struggling with, given her interest in debt issues, et cetera. But overall, how does, what does this mean for the, the fund? Well, this has been, I mean, this being a crisis like no other has meant uh, that the IMF has had to come through in a way that it hasn't had to in the past. Uh, we've, we had, you know, a very, very large number, 90 plus number of countries that came to us for support. Uh, we provided uh, financing for 80, for around eight different forms of financing for around 82 countries. Now, you know, usually IMF, a financing comes with uh, a program, which is then comes with conditionalities. Uh, and the most common form of financing that we provided this time round, I think to around 70 countries, if I remember my last count, uh, is what's called emergency financing. Uh, and emergency financing does not have conditionalities. It was able, we were able to get money into the hands of, of, uh, of countries quickly so that they could deal with the health crisis. And you, by the way, you know, one of the reasons low-income countries even were able to do 2% of their spending came from the, from the financing that was uh, uh, provided by the IMF for several of these uh, economies. So, uh, so that was first thing. First thing was, as opposed to having the standard, you know, deliberative program, which comes with conditionalities, we had to make sure that there was enough resources to provide emergency financing, the very no conditionalities effectively to a large number of countries. That was the first part of it. Uh, the second thing, of course, was debt service relief to our uh, poorer members who owe money to the IMF. Uh, it was it's not it was not just a moratorium; it was literally relief, which is that you're you're not having to pay it. Uh, that that's been uh, extended until April, and I will be you know likely extended longer. Um, I think the challenge um, uh, going forward is, of course, for countries that will. You know, there were countries who entered this crisis with, with debt distress, then they got hit by a, a pandemic that was not their fault, uh, but they're now even greater debt distress. And, 
you know, in, the, in this case, is debt relief and providing more money is not going to solve the problem. It will require debt restructuring. Uh, there's the G20 common framework that was uh, agreed upon, which you know puts all creditors on a level playing field, uh, official creditors and private creditors. Uh, but again, I think the uh, will the test will be in seeing how that actually gets implemented. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's not that it's not very easy to get the private sector on. Uh, but again, but you know, this really has to show that this can be done uh, because there are there are countries, poorer nations. Uh, who will need that. And then, of course, in terms of just even operationally and functioning, we've had to function remotely um, with all of the many of our member countries. So instead of missions that go to countries, we're doing everything virtually uh, and dealing with a pandemic for which there's no textbook response as a solution. So we've had to be uh, quite uh, creative and forward looking in dealing with this. Um, but again, and again, helping countries in terms of technical capacity. Um, so it's been, it's been a, it's been a, uh, a whole new kind of crisis to deal with. And, uh, you know, I, uh, while the international community has come together and, and, you know, our membership has provided support in making sure we have concessional financing, you know, but I agree with Martin, there is a whole lot that still needs to be done. I was smiling there because, um... Uh, uh, it's great to know that the IMF has just acquired a new ambassador in Amitabh Bachchan, who has been uh, <laughs> talking about uh, how good a chief economist uh, the IMF has. And uh, one of our uh, attendees was wishing that the Big B was uh, on this call. I don't think he is, but I'm sure he'll hear about it. Uh, a, a couple of last questions then, Geeta. This has just been fantastic. Um, the uh, nature of work and jobs we all think is going to change. And the fact that you know we have you sitting in Washington uh, in your morning and here we are on the other side of the world uh, is a manifestation of that. What's that going to do to international trade? And what's that going to do uh, f this notion of jobs moving from developed countries to developing countries? There's a whole new dimension to that if we can overcome time zone differences. And certainly in a lot of knowledge work, that's not an issue at all. How is this going to affect the future of global trade? Uh, so a couple of things before I get to the impact on global trade. Uh, I actually think that one of the, you know, troubling legacies, of, I don't know if it's troubling, but one of the legacies of this crisis that we'll have, the world will have to tackle with is the uh, acceleration towards greater automation. So you know, in many parts, many parts of the world, it's very likely that late, you know, that a lot of jobs will come back uh, once countries reopen. But we are shifting to a, 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 a world where uh, there will be greater automation, digitalization. Uh, you know, higher skilled workers will get compens will get much more than low skilled workers will, and so everything that that was so the seeds of a rise in inequality will probably get accelerated uh, coming out of this. And this is something that I think governments will have to grapple with, which is make sure that there are enough jobs uh, for, for everyone, to make sure that there is skill training, that there is um, you know, uh, support provided uh, to education support provided to workers. Now, of course, all of that is it's good sounding words, but it's always just that harder. That's one of the areas that's been pretty hard for the world, uh, for countries to make happen. You know, it, it, it's um, skill training works in some ways, but it doesn't work. It's just, it's just difficult. So I think that's one area. And the second thing to keep in mind, and, and you know, I like the work of Dano Nassimoglu on that front, which is to say that while in the past, it was always the case that uh, you know, technological improvements came, were on net job creating, uh, because yes, yeah, some people lose their jobs, but a whole lot more people make jobs. So on net, it's, it creates jobs, but that's not the case. Uh, doesn't seem necessarily the case in these last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, that it's it, the argument that these are on net job creating is not uh, automatic. So I think I think we have to explore different ways of thinking about how to bring back jobs, and that's going to be essential for inequality and social unrest and so on. Uh, in terms of global trade, yes, I think there are uh, the you know I would say that some of the you know. A lot of the concerns one had about global trade was on the political side. Uh, and if 
another good reason to exit this crisis as soon as possible is to you know, make sure that countries come back to full employment faster. Because it's in situations when that doesn't happen, that protectionism really comes back in a, in a roaring way in countries. And that's what we saw after the global financial crisis. So another argument for ending this pandemic and getting everybody uh, back to normal is, is to get this right. Uh, you know, there's obviously during this time, there's been uh, the trade agreements have been signed. There was the RCEP, you know, then there was EU, uh, uh, EU and China. So there is progress being made, um, but you know, it will. There are many still many frictions that have to be addressed. Uh, there are still reforms of the WTO that are needed, uh, and I think it's still early days to tell whether how much of you know the new ad, what the new administration policies will be on this front in the U.S. Thank you, Gita. With that, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to call it a close. This has been fantastic. I think we've all just uh, greatly enjoyed the kind of uh, uh, broad landscape that you've covered, and then, of course, your very insightful questions uh, uh, that you've answered. So thank you very much, and I'd like to uh, thank all our attendees. Uh, we had a very large number. Uh, and look forward very much to having future such conversations. Uh, Gita's uh, talk and lecture will be on the uh, NCR website in a little while. So will her presentation. And uh, please uh, look it up. Uh, we will uh, collate your questions and also take a look at what we can ourselves supply some answers to. So again, with that, let me wish everybody in India at least a very good evening. And Gita, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. And I think it's a great connect from a person who happened to be at the birth of the IMF to now the chief economist of the IMF. Thank you again. And uh, everybody stay safe. And please take care. Thank you and good night. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shaker.